The first thing I would like to declare after all those wonderful words is that I, I'm, I'm basically an idiot because I did meet Jack Ma in 1999 and I worked with the company in its early years. Um, but actually, uh, I was offered some, some uh, uh, shares in the company, a uh, warrant to buy those shares at uh, 30 cents. And uh, um, in my wisdom, in 2003, I was preoccupied with some other things. Uh, I either forgot or didn't write the check. I didn't do that. It was a 30 million dollar mistake. So uh, any copy of the book that you buy is, is gratefully received. <laughs> but I, I think I can also blame USC because that was around the time that I came to talk about the China internet for the fir one of the first conferences of the China US internet forum was actually here at USC and it was during uh, SARS. There's a gentleman here wearing a mask. It was reminding me of how I felt when I came to USC from China. Nobody wanted to shake my hand because this was right in the middle of the SARS. And ironically this was the time when uh, Alibaba, particularly Taobao, was created and then soon after Alipay. So those two essential apps that we're hearing around um, go back to 2003. But as we heard, you know, the company goes back to 99. Um, and uh, I should say that um, hopefully my early mistake is the only mistake, big mistake in my life. But I, I did find some interesting therapy in writing this book. And actually, you mentioned Shirley Lin, who's coming here in a couple of weeks. And she's, I just had lunch with her in Washington, uh, an expert on Taiwan relations. Her, she also started out as an investment banker. We were in the same class at Morgan Stanley. So I would like to say that if you have been a banker or you're briefly a banker, don't worry. You know, things can get better. You can try to, <laughs> in my case, I chose to write as, as did Shirley. But Shirley actually uh, had left Morgan Stanley and went to uh, Goldman Sachs. And she was the first investor in Alibaba. Goldman Sachs bought half of Alibaba in 99, just, before, just a few months after I'd met Jack, for $5 million. Now in their wisdom, they sold that stake uh, in early 2004. Actually, Shirley had left the firm. And uh, they sold that stake for about $20 million. Now, as we heard, the market capitalization today of Alibaba is uh, over a quarter of a trillion dollars. So if you make a big mistake in your life, as I did, find somebody who's made a much bigger mistake, <laughs> and you feel much better. So Shirley was very helpful to me in the book. And she shares her story uh, for the first time uh, in the book. So the book, as we heard, is in English. It's in Chinese. We'll talk about some other editions coming out. The China one, I'm going to Beijing on Sunday and doing the book tour in Hangzhou and Shanghai. Um, look, I mean, we've already heard. People from China, why do I need to know about anything more about Jack? I mean, there's at least 300 books about Jack. And uh, so mine is just you know, another in that pile. But actually, I must say, it's number two in China right now, which is great, because I think we found some interesting things. Of course, I'm a foreigner. I had some contact with him, but I am sort of had access, but I'm not part of the Alibaba story in a way, which is the way it should be, I think, for an independent author. So let's go back. Why are we even talking about this company? And this is the impossible triangle. This is something you can draw, but rather like this building, it's very difficult to make it work. <laughs> so, um, and I understand this building was designed by the Dean of Architecture, so we, we should pay respect to this building, but it is quite difficult. In fact, with the Dean and I, we ourselves found it difficult to find it. He's been here for 10 years. So um, This actually is a, a useful analogy for what Jack has done, because again, you can draw this, but you can't make this. This is what I call the Iron Triangle. In fact, these are Jack's words, we should say. This is bringing together three things, uh, e-commerce, finance, and logistics. So we were just hearing about the essential apps you need. One is Taobao. That's how you discover the products. The other is Alipay. That's how you pay for them. And the third, which you don't see here in the US uh, with Alibaba, is logistics. Here you have FedEx, you have UPS, you have reliable courier services. Those did not exist <coughs> in China. So Jack's genius, if you will, is bringing together three things in one. That's, what, that's really what is the machinery that makes Alibaba what it is today. And I call it really the architecture of trust, because the rarest thing in China, other than fresh air, <laughs> is, tr is trust. By the way, fresh air is coming back, actually, uh, I must admit. Maybe it was G20 when they dictated, you know, <laughs> pollution needed to have a license, so it didn't, didn't appear. But uh, this, really, this is really why we're talking about the company. It's just the ability to have overcome these obstacles. Uh, because Alibaba was not the first consumer e-commerce company. There was one called 8848, which was founded much earlier than Alibaba. 8848, by the way, is the height in meters of Mount Everest. So this idea, like Amazon, you know, the, the idea that we choose a, a symbol like this. Um, but actually, 8848 failed. And I write about that in the book. The book is not just about Alibaba. It's about the whole history of the internet. It failed because it didn't crack both the payment and the logistics side. People just didn't want to buy something online. They were afraid of getting ripped off, never receiving the goods, not being able to return them. 
And if anything, if you were a consumer in China who is now living in the States, you probably find eBay and Amazon very, very frustrating. Um, you miss it. You miss the experience of Alibaba. Much as we should say WeChat is far superior, I think, to anything coming from you know, uh, WhatsApp or Facebook. Um, and this is important because it shows that China is innovating in ways, but it's often incremental innovation. But it's combining things in ways which give a, a very rich consumer experience. So let's go beyond the Iron Triangle and look at this map of Zhejiang. Now, until about two or three weeks ago, maybe this was more a necessary exercise to explain to people about Hangzhou and Zhejiang. Now, the G20, uh, of course, well, the aim of the G20 was to sort of put Hangzhou on the map, although there was sort of an incident at the airport uh, with Air Force One, uh, which I saw summarized in a tweet recently. Hashtag Hangjover. What is a Hangjover? <laughs> a Hangjover is when you spend $25 billion and you send millions of people sort of away on vacation, shut down factories, and for this two-day event, and the only thing people remember is a missing staircase. Um, but, <laughs> but in a sense, Hangzhou is a provincial town. It is not Beijing. It is not Shanghai. Some people speculate the reason why Air Force One didn't have the stairs there because maybe the local officials weren't so used to this kind of political sort of uh, event. But it's a very, um, it's the essence of commercial or of entrepreneurship. This is really the mecca of entrepreneurship. In fact, a lot of Middle Eastern traders travel every day to Yiwu, which has an international airport. You've never heard of Yiwu, but most of you probably haven't heard of Yiwu. But most of you this morning probably, I hope, used something like this, a toothbrush. Now, 99% of the world's toothbrushes are, are made in Zhejiang. So um, you probably start your day and end your day with things that have either been made or traded in Zhejiang. You just didn't know it. Um, particularly Yiwu, which is a trading center. Also, Wenzhou. Now, Wenzhou, if you would like to buy an apartment pretty much anywhere in the world, you're SOL, because the people from Wenzhou have probably just the night before bought the whole building. Okay. <laughs> These are some of the most unpopular people in China. They're the, the Beverly Hillbillies, if I may coin a term. <laughs> the new rich. Zhejiang province is really where, you know, almost laws didn't exist, that there was really no regulatory environment to say you couldn't do it. So people just went ahead and did things. And the, the toothbrush is an example that I use in the book for several reasons. The first is that in 1982, the Wenzhou government summoned people who were involved in business activities, trading, and it could, very low-level stuff then, surplus agricultural production, uh, what we call the town and village enterprise, and they were making some money. Um, but was it okay for them to make money? In fact, in 1982, it wasn't. So the, the city government arrested all of the uh, so entrepreneurs, the ge ti hu, as they call them in Chinese, and next year, they they had a, a similar call to people involved in these activities. And the, uh, the business people who went along to the government fearfully carried toothbrushes in their pocket because allegedly, or apparently, in Chinese prison, they don't give you a toothbrush. They don't give you much else either. So I always carry a toothbrush with me as a foreigner in China. <laughs> but, uh, but actually, those people uh, were not arrested, and the previous batch were released. And that was the beginning of really uh, the economic transformation of Zhejiang, and in fact, the country. Now, people often think of uh, you know, Deng Xiaoping's Southern Tour, but remember, that was the early 90s. And actually, it was Zhejiang that really led the way um, in allowing people to kind of form their own enterprises and sort of find their own way. And you'll see today, I mean, I mentioned toothbrushes, but here I show ties, dresses, motorcycles. Everything is made in Zhejiang. Socks, there are actually two sock cities in China. One makes left socks and one makes right socks. <laughs> um, but no, the fact is there's overproduction. And this, Actually, as we know, this is part of China's challenge, is that they're making too much stuff, um, and often it's too generic. And so rather than the toothbrush, in fact, where is the, the Colgate or the Crest coming from China, a brand that we would trust? If you think about that architecture of trust, when we think of China outside China, we hear stories, and maybe, maybe it's unfair, of things like poisonous dog food, or, and they say you should always do, eat the dog food. I wouldn't recommend that in China. <laughs> or uh, drywall, or we've had all these high-profile problems, like you can't trust Chinese products. But, Actually, a lot of these products were the first products that Chinese ever consumed that were not made by the government. So it used to be these state factories. And actually, a lot of what these, first, these people were making were fake. They would use brands you know, that uh, were copies. But this was really how the oxygen came for the private sector in China. And I show here the town of Tonglu, which is a small town about 100 kilometers from Hangzhou. Three of the four largest logistics companies, the courier companies in China, are based in that one town. And actually, the people involved who founded them are related or were classmates. It's as though FedEx, UPS, and so DHL came from this classroom. <laughs> and why? Because they've served 
Alibaba. So Hangzhou at the top of the map is the provincial capital of China. Um, it is an important political town actually because as I learned in the excellent documentary series uh, that the, the center has made uh, by Mike Chinoy and others, um, when President Nixon traveled to China, the entourage stopped in Hangzhou, in fact, and many people speculate that the, well actually it was true, the draft, the famous Shanghai communique was actually drafted in, in Hangzhou. And you can actually visit the hotel um, where they stayed, which is now the Shangri-La Hotel um, in Hangzhou, and that actually comes out as we move forward into um, Jack's story. So the fact is Hangzhou is a tourist center today and was a very early uh, opening uh, city actually for tourism. In 1979, 800 foreigners came to Zhejiang. In 1980, it was 40,000. And amongst them, oops, was this. <laughs> I'll get back to the toothbrush in a second. This gentleman um, is my age today. This is in 1980. Here he's 15 years old. Uh, th I'm 36. No, I'm not. I'm 48. <laughs> uh, his name is David Morley. And David and I have become friends. I've randomly found a story about uh, an Australian family that Jack had a connection with early on in Alibaba's history, and I never read anything else about it. Anyway, I tracked him down in the writing of this book. And I, it, it's kind of an interesting lesson in how do entrepreneurs get their lucky break? Like, how did Jack, who is actually, frankly, was not a very good student, uh, he's terrible at math, still to this day. Luckily, he has people around him who are very good at math. <laughs> uh, but how did he get his break? Well, this actually is uh, outside, um, this is on the West Lake in Shanghai, the very lake that the G20 leaders were taken onto. In fact, Matteo Renzi, I think, was attacked by a flying fish, actually, on this thing. So, um, anyway, it's, uh, it's a beautiful setting, and Hangzhou still has that pull. But Jack used that pull to create his opportunity. He would go up to tourists who were visiting the city and say, look, for free, for free, <laughs> I will show you my town. Uh, and uh, it'll help me improve my English. I will be your tour guide. Now, fast forward to today, I should just say, if you go to China, to Beijing, Shanghai, if you're not Chinese, and somebody walks up to you and say, hey, I'm an art student, I'm learning, like, can you, I, I can show you my town, don't do it, it's a scam. <laughs> <laughs> I know this to be true. They will take you to a tea shop uh, owned by their friend, and you'll have one sip of tea, and they say, that's 2,000 RMB, that, that's a very special tea, pay up now, so don't do that. Um, but back in 1980, uh, this was a happier time, a uh, very <laughs> naive time, uh, this was really China's opening to the world. So Jack uh, befriended um, David. In fact, David was trying to light a, flick a lit match outside the Shangri-La Hotel, uh, possibly, well, then it wasn't even the Shangri-La, it was the Hangzhou guest house or something. He almost burned down uh, a pagoda or something, and they say that a single spark will light a prairie fire. Well, Jack actually went up to him and said, maybe you shouldn't be flicking matches, um, and they became friends, they became pen pals. Rather embarrassingly in the book, there are some of Jack's early pen pal correspondence. <laughs> and David's father, Ken, uh, took an interest in what he called the Barrow Boys. Now, the, this family is from New South Wales. In fact, if you're ever in Newcastle, New South Wales, David runs a yoga studio today um, <laughs> there. But from a very modest uh, background, the family, in fact, um, Ken Morley, can you hear me? I'm not really using the mic, but sorry. <laughs> Ken Morley actually um, was a socialist, and uh, his wife, uh, was a communist, a member of the Australian Communist Party. So in 1980, this Australian family had come to China because the parents wanted to show the children a uh, worker's paradise. The next year, they actually went to Havana. I wonder if they met any Cuban entrepreneurs. I should check on that, but <laughs> kind of late coming, I think, in Cuba. But um, so the irony of the story, of course, is that by helping Jack, the Morley family lent him money, in fact. Uh, he bought his first apartment and the richest man in Asia was basically helped to be created by this Australian socialist and communist couple, etc. That was an interesting little ironical story. Um, and here's Jack showing off um, in his first apartment that was purchased by the Morleys. This is not the apartment where he founded uh, Alibaba, but it gives you a sense of how he was able to take, take the sort of risk that he did. And here he's clearly showing off his, his microwave, his refrigerator, you know. Um, back then those were the big deal. Um, and many countries still are. Um, but I'm going to go back a second, because when I walked into the apartment in Hangzhou, where Jack and 17 others had founded the company, I was using the bathroom, and I came across two mugs stuffed with toothbrushes. And in fact, there were 18 toothbrushes. There are 18 co-founders. You got a sense, these people rarely go home. <laughs> they were working around the clock. Of these 18 people, nearly all of them had actually worked for Jack for some time. Alibaba is Jack's third venture. His first venture, uh, was a translation business. Um, while he was doing translation for these merchants that were trying to export their products, 
he could hardly pay rent or payroll, so he was still selling plastic carpets. He would buy them in Iwu, <laughs> and he would go to somebody and say, can I translate your, uh, your information uh, in English so you can find buyers? They'd probably say, no, get lost. Said, How about a plastic carpet? I got a deal right now. <laughs> so Jack, is a, a, his essence is a, uh, is a merchant. He understands what it is, and that's his constituency. But he's also a great communicator. As we saw, he would approach the tourists, uh, convince them to sort of let, let them hang out with him. And uh, his parents were actually storytellers. In fact, a form of ping tan, which is a sort of singing and dancing. He's basically the world's biggest bullshit artist, actually. <laughs> um, and he's doing that now. His audience isn't the Morleys. It's, we'll see, the company that he keeps. But I think he is the team. You know, it's not just Jack. And Shirley said the same thing. When she walked into the Alibaba apartment just a few months after I had been there, and she ended up buying half the company very wisely, um, she said it, was, it wasn't just about Jack. Jack is quirky, he is interesting, but there were people who were like his disciples. And some of these people had followed him through his first venture, that translation business, his second business called China Pages, which was an internet business, which also failed. And they'd even followed Jack to Beijing when he was working uh, for the government after having failed twice. So you can see that it was never just Jack. It's always been about the people around him as well, including his wife, Kathy. And in fact, a third of the 18 co-founders of Alibaba are women, which puts Silicon Valley to shame. <laughs> um, anyway, so fast forward. This is after Jack's second venture had failed, and he went to Beijing uh, to work for the Ministry of Commerce. And I actually met Jerry Yang on this first trip, uh, his first trip to China. Of course, Jerry Yang, very famous, being a sort of a son of China, Taiwan, Taiwan version, <laughs> who came over to California, made great. And don't forget how big a company was in you know, Yahoo in 97, 98. This was just you know, gold dust, right? So you can imagine the crowds when Jerry came to Beijing. But Jack actually was tapped by his bosses at the Ministry of Commerce, say, hey, we've got some foreigner in town. Can you take him out to the Great Wall? So the second lucky break, I mean, the Morleys and other people, but also being this tour guide, again, he's still being tour guide. This is um, Kathy, Jack's wife. In the Alibaba pictures, she's cropped out. Apparently, at her own volition, she didn't want to be in the picture. But I, my friend was here that day, so I got the picture. I want to give Kathy her due. She was very important in the early days of the company when I worked with them. Um, but again, it's kind of, you make your own luck, you know, but. You know, um, Jack is a very, he's not a shy person, he loves communicating, he's very proud of his country, he's proud of his province as well. So he put himself out there, and as a result, opportunities came his way. Now, fast forward seven years after this, and Yahoo invested $1 billion in Alibaba, which is really one of the big reasons we're talking about the company today, because he, he was able to defeat eBay, creating his status as an icon in China and really on the global field. So this chance meeting actually played a big, big role in his life as well. Um, and this is, you know, the happy, clappy kind of co-founders of Alibaba. This is the apartment, uh, actually it's Kathy's apartment, uh, where they, they founded the company. I know it's Kathy's because I snuck in there last year to the compound and I saw a gas bill in her name for like 52 quiet that they had to pay by Tuesday. I was like, she's probably good for that. Um, but, but, you know, she actually uh, had helped invest in the company as well, her family. Uh, but also here you can see some of these people then have followed Jack for years already at this point. So it's a bit like that movie Life of Brian. You know, maybe Jack wasn't wanting to be followed, but people would, would follow him. <laughs> and uh, I actually went with Jack to speak at Harvard Business School in January of 2000. And we're walking along the banks of the river, it's freezing cold in January, and there was a film crew like walking with us. And I said, oh, this is nice. Did the school put this on? He's like, no, no, no. Uh, this lady, she's been filming me for five years. She's from <laughs> Zhejiang University. <laughs> I was like, how do you know you're going to be that famous? <laughs> so I've learned, uh, you know, the impossibility, the, the, the love of ambition. And he, Jack would say crazy things, and people called him Crazy Jack. I will be bigger than Amazon. I will be bigger than eBay. And this was like 18 people in an apartment. But somehow you wanted to believe him. Because also he would he'd be very self-deprecating. He didn't do the face thing. He didn't talk about his connections. He did the opposite. He said, you know, I have nothing. I, I'm dumb. I just surround myself by other people who know better. And that, that really gave him a lot of publicity that, you know, here's this guy defying everything. He didn't go to Tsinghua University. He didn't come here to the U.S. Um, in fact, after that trip to Harvard, uh, when Jack had some early success, people said, oh, he went to Harvard. No, no, he just gave a speech there. He's like, I went to tell them, you know, that they're stupid. And he did. I was in the audience with him at Harvard. Shirley, our friend, had just invested in the company, sitting in the front row. And he said, you know, you mu you're really dumb. I mean, Shirley went to Harvard here, and she just bought half my company. Why? I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> He's basically a stand-up comedian, you know. Um, but there's method to his madness, and his mantra is, you know, customer first. Remember, he's, he's really a merchant at heart. Employee second, shareholder third. And he'll keep repeating that. Of course, it doesn't mean he, he wants his shareholders to be unhappy and lose money, um, but he's talking about the long term. You have to stick with Jack. 
Not, people don't always get him. In fact, Joe Tsai, the vice chairman of Alibaba, who went to Yale, third generation Yale, in fact, his, he just gave $30 million to Yale, we should, we should get, get Joe here. <laughs> uh, he's very much the opposite of Jack. He, he went, you know, uh, fine schools, uh, he was at public school in, uh, or private school in New Jersey, he went to Yale, he's the establishment. Jack is, sometimes often surrounds himself by people who are the opposite of him. He knows his weaknesses. That's another key uh, feature for entrepreneurs. So uh, anyway, let's uh, get quickly to Q&A. But firstly, um, so you know that actually Alibaba is here in Los Angeles, in Pasadena. Of course, here we are at USC. So we know that the film and entertainment industry in Hollywood is in the west side. But Alibaba Pictures is in Pasadena, I guess, because like my sister here is from Pasadena. My brother-in-law is a Caltech professor. So I, I know that the good Chinese food is it's not here, it's, it's over in San Gabriel, <laughs> Arcadia, around there. So, so maybe Alibaba is sort of disrupting entertainment by, by pulling people east. So these Hollywood executives have to drive to Pasadena now to have their meetings. But, but they're also, of course, in Seattle, where Jack first discovered the internet in 95, and that's in the book, in San Francisco, San Mateo. But I should show, on this map, they're also in New York, in Washington, and in Europe, they're now in Paris, London, Milan, Munich. Why? Because Alibaba is not really here to sort of conquer America or conquer Europe yet. Uh, they're coming to bring uh, Western brands to China. So here, of course, the West Coast is more about entertainment, technology, uh, but increasingly Alibaba, and particularly Tmall, which is the website that really is the, the future of Alibaba, increasingly is, the, is where merchants can sell to directly consumers. They want to bring the likes of Coach or Louis Vuitton or whatever to uh, Chinese consumers. I mentioned earlier Taobao. So Taobao is a scrappy, it's like a, it's like a stall. I mean, anybody can put up a stall on Taobao. It's free. That's another feature of Jack, make it free. And you can sell what you want, including, by the way, sometimes the dodgy pirated stuff. Alibaba is just a platform. They say, we're not Amazon. We don't get involved uh, in you know, selling to you. We don't have inventory. Um, but the future of Alibaba increasingly is Tmall. They want to bring higher level of brands and services because Chinese consumers can afford more and they want authentic goods. By the way, that's why we all know they're coming here to California <laughs> you know, buying, buying stuff. Um, and so you'll see more of, of Alibaba in, in the West, but you'll also see them more in other places. So, of course, here he's with Jack with some guy. You know, Jack increasingly is sort of in the company of people you might have seen before, um, including, and, you know, the common feature is like most pictures of Jack with somebody, they're laughing, you know. Uh, he just has this infectious kind of sense of humor. Uh, be wary, you know, when you laugh, you know, what's he getting out of it? No, he's a great guy, but, you know, uh, in this picture at the top uh, left, you know, this is in uh, Manila a year ago when President Obama at the APEC seminar actually uh, interviewed Jack. He was the moderator for Jack, uh, no pressure, but yeah, <laughs> and a Filipina entrepreneur. It's actually part of the White House's strategy to sort of showcase younger entrepreneurs and so on. But the very image of you know, the president sort of passing the mic and so on. I mean, Jack's uh, rivals in China said, what the hell? The White House has become part of the Alibaba PR team here. <laughs> and then we have, of course, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, who we know is, is learning Chinese. Um, we can say that um, Jack's English will always be better probably than uh, Mark Zuckerberg's. Uh, uh, Chinese, but um, you can see again this sort of funny expression on his face. Now we have little potato, as he's known in China. So you know that uh, Justin Trudeau, Trudeau sounds like Tudo, potato. So they call him Xiao Tudo, <laughs> little potato here with a side of lobster. Uh, this is the launch in G20 uh, or B20, the Business 20 Forum of the Canada Pavilion on Tmall. Again, I mentioned that they're bringing authentic goods online. Um, for consumers and these types of things, and same with uh, cherries from Washington State, will be packed in ice, air freighted in 747s, and then distributed within 72 hours to tables around China. So you can imagine. I mean, it's you know, increasingly. I miss that stuff here. I'm not I, here. I can go to Costco. I can you know, I'm cheap. But um, you can get good stuff. But you can't in China from the local store. So he's really showing that the e-commerce is actually much more than it means here in the U.S. This is how many people discover choice for the first time. That trust element. Now, we, this is just a week ago, um, but uh, this is the Italian uh, Prime Minister, Renzi, um, with Jack, drinking wine. Um, we, talk, we know about 11-11, the Taobao um, Singles Day, November 11th, which is bigger than Cyber Monday and Black Friday combined. Well, uh, uh, Jack has come up with another festival, the 9th of September. Why? Because nine sounds like wine in English. It does also in Chinese, jiu and jiu. So here he is with Matteo Renzi. And of course, now Jack, again, very cunningly, has recently purchased four chateaux in uh, Bordeaux. <laughs> um, and now he's set up a buying frenzy of uh, vineyards in France because everybody wants to be Jack Ma's neighbor. Um, but this wine and spirits festival was to celebrate um, the, uh, the consumption, you know, the, the, the shift that we are seeing 
of China to a middle class driven thing. I think it's also, is it Mao's birthday or the day Mao died? Somebody said, the day he died. The day he died. So it's like, well, there's an interesting thing, the fact that you could choose that. Size. So be careful what you celebrate, but uh, anyway, it's a, it's a sign of a, the, the two Chinas, if you will, not the mainland Taiwan, but increasingly this private sector, middle class driven China. Okay, so quickly, some other words. Uh, the book is, my book is coming out in different countries, but partly um, because this website, AliExpress, is very popular in places you might not think, like in Russia, or Ukraine, or Bulgaria, or Brazil. So what Alibaba did was basically translate the stuff uh, that they had on Taobao and say, look, let's translate into Russian. We'll put it in Portuguese, see what happens. They became the number one website in Russia overnight <laughs> for e-commerce. In fact, they crashed the Russian postal service. There were so many goods being ordered. Uh, I don't know what happened to the Minister of Post in Russia. I don't want to know. But, um, and today, these are still very popular um, uh, websites. So if you think about it, like in the West, you know, here we are, we can drive to very efficient retail spaces, we can order on Amazon, we don't necessarily need to know about Alibaba. The people who know about Alibaba in America, I found, are the people at the very top. The Wall Street people said, yeah, I had like, you know, 30 million shares, I'm like, oh, don't tell me <laughs> that they bought in the IPO and they made all this money. Or it's like the Uber drivers. I found an interesting thing, where I've been going around, it's like, I know Alibaba. In fact, somebody even said to me, do you know a company called Alibaba? I was in Watford in England, and uh, this driver was saying, I buy mangoes on this site called Alibaba. And the guy's from Pakistan, and he's, I thought it was a Middle Eastern company, but it's, it's a Chinese company, did you know that? And what he does is between his Uber drives, he buys mangoes and he distributes to fruit and vegetable shop. So a lot of, like, if you will, like the lower crust and the upper crust in the West, they know about Alibaba, but the middle classes don't really need to know much about it until they go to see Star Trek and they see Alibaba pictures right in your face, but it's, it's marginal. So. Um, but in these emerging markets, Jack, people know him because he's like Chinatown. Who doesn't like Chinatown? Like cheap prices, great choice. And in places like Russia, where they don't make anything except wars, um, you know, that's, that's actually, <laughs> sorry, there's great culture and so on. But, uh, but it is interesting that Jack has become a transcendent figure in these places. He is effectively the American dream set in China. Um, and part of this dream, though, is, you know, there's another, there's the Chinese dream. So, <laughs> Uh, we, know, we don't really know what the Chinese dream means. We just know it's generally about increasing prosperity, stability, and so on. Um, and so this is a very interesting relationship, of course. This is in 2006, uh, when um, Xi Jinping was the party secretary of Shanghai, and he visited Hangzhou. Um, he actually had not visited Alibaba while he was uh, in charge of Zhejiang, which is interesting. Uh, but now, of course, we can update this picture for 10 days ago. Um, but, you know, like President Xi Jinping was in Manila with the, you know, President Obama a year ago, but we didn't really hear that much press. So, the talk about soft power, what China craves, is it really going to be delivered by Xi Jinping's, or is it increasingly going to be these entrepreneurs that we can identify with, uh, like Jack? Um, anyway, the book is coming out in all these different languages, partly reflecting the interest in Jack as an individual. Um, in, and places, it's like in India is number one, but also in Latin America and Middle East, but people are sort of identifying with this guy. He's like a non, non-American <laughs> kind of internet legend, you know? And so the best thing I had of the, China, the, the book tour here in the US was a Chinese student came up and said, thank you, for putting somebody with a face like this on a book like this. I said, well, he's not the, not the best looking guy. Oh, no, 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 he, the fact that he's Chinese. <laughs> because we've had enough of the, the white guy who, you know, frankly, Jeff Bezos went to Princeton and we have the Harvard connection. So this is kind of a, a sort of a person of the people, if you will. I think the next should be a woman from China, but that's another story. Anyway, the book I'm very pleased to say was named uh, one of the best business books of the year. And November 22nd, I get to put on my, I'm so glad the other person won uh, award a <laughs> face. Um, but I'm, I'm up against Alan Greenspan, it was a, a distinctive face, uh, a book about Alan Greenspan and some others, but it, it's, it's great to have the recognition in, in the West. Um, and here's my vanity pictures. Now, Joe Tsai, I uh, encourage in the book, his story comes out very strongly, like the man behind, if you will. And Joe, um, Joe liked the book, although when he was, he was signing it for somebody, he wanted his signature, and he said, yeah, I only appear on page 197, so it's rather embarrassing. But luckily, I haven't been sued by the company. Uh, but uh, no, I think it's something that is, you know, giving some context for this, the story of the rise of the private sector and the rise of the internet. So I should say one thing, as we're in Hollywood, um, Crazy Jack, I would love for Steve Martin to play a wild and crazy Jack in the movie because we know that, you know, white people play Asian roles. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so let's talk. So thank you. <laughs>